Hey, good morning, Jim. Who are morning. we talking to today? Well, today, Gordon, we have this. <laughs> 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 hey, let's try it again. Right. Three, two. Well, today, Courtney, we have Evan Knox, who currently serves as the CEO of Caffeine Marketing, founder of Caffeine Labs, and partner and CMO of Bowman Fly Fishing. Awesome. Really interesting. Well, let's hop in. Woohoo! You are listening to Tribe Pod, a podcast series of interviews of interest to the HR community. It is hosted by Courtney Lane. Produced by Jim Stroud, sponsored by Proactive Talent, and enjoyed by you. Today's episode begins right after this. Recruitment marketing, as compared to maybe employer branding, is all about getting your message and your story in front of the right audience. It's a lot to manage. And what Practive Talent does for our clients is we help centralize. So you have one partner, one vendor to help you manage all those relationships. And not only that, we help you track the effectiveness of every media dollar you spend on hiring so that you know in real time that you're getting the greatest ROI for your marketing investment to attract great talent into your company. We help our clients with recruitment marketing in a couple ways. One is a recruitment marketing strategy. And with that, we really take the time to help you build the right strategy. And then we get mutual approval on that strategy before you spend a single dime. The other way we do this is through our agency of record service. This is a partnership with you where we're able to reach out to publishers on your behalf to negotiate better pricing, to execute on media campaigns, uh, and really act as an extension of your team some of the benefits that our clients have seen working with Practive Talents Recruitment Marketing Services is an overall reduction of 30% cost per applicant. That's really significant. It's showing that we're able to leverage great technology, programmatic, and we're also flexible and scalable. We're platform agnostic. We're always going to use whatever the greatest and latest technology is, whatever the best platforms are to help create efficiencies in your media purchasing so that you're always on the cutting edge. For more information on Proactive Talent, visit them online at proactivetalent.com or click the link in the podcast description. Well, hey, today I am joined by Evan Knox, who is the founder of Caffeine Marketing and a small business investor. Caffeine Marketing it makes profitable, profitable marketing easier for small companies. Um, so Evan, You'll do a better job than I because I'm stumbling as I'm trying to get my morning brain working. Uh, tell us about Caffeine Marketing. What is it? What, what do you guys do there? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. But we make marketing profitable for small companies that are doing less than $25 million a year in annual revenue. And you know the actual nuts and bolts of how we do that could be everything from websites to advertising, you name it. But ultimately, our brand promise is that we make marketing profitable for these guys because most entrepreneurs just throw stuff on the wall hoping something sticks, and that's no way to scale and grow a company. So, what got you interested in this area? I mean, what? Why become a marketing guy? Well, it all goes back to my my grandfather actually. So, my grandfather owned a business. My dad owned a business. Um, it, I would say my, my grandfather was more of an entrepreneur than my dad, but anyway, business owners, entrepreneur, we'll talk about that and the differences. And then my great grandfather did. So I grew up with this culture of like, Hey, always start your own thing. And, um, I always had other preteens working for me as a teenager, cause I would go mow lawns and hire them out to go do it. So anyway, that was just, <laughs> I always loved business and entrepreneurialism. And then marketing actually started from when I would go to work with my grandfather on the weekends. And so I'd go in in his jewelry store, so like watches and gauge rings and all that jazz. And he would walk me through exactly what he was doing for marketing. And he would teach me. And he would also teach me sales. The, the man's brilliant. And so he would be like, hey, we're, putting a, we're going to put this in the ad. It needs to have these details. Most people create ads. They have this mistake in it. And this is like old school print media. Like we'd be putting stuff in the Atlanta Symphony, which is like a you know, symphony here in Atlanta. Right. For their little pamphlet or whatever. So that was my first introduction into marketing. And then about four years ago, part of my role at a nonprofit that I was working at was also marketing. And so, uh, you know, I, it was my, it was time to move on from that organization for me and my wife. We moved back from Charlotte, we moved from Charlotte to Atlanta. And I thought, you know what, my dad is no longer with us. Uh, My grandfather's about to retire and I've got this marketing skill set. So 
I can't help them anymore, but I can't help other business owners and like them. So that's why I started, decided to start caffeine marketing. Awesome. Well, and I love that it has that sort of family piece to it. And it sounds like your grandfather was maybe just sort of a natural marketer or did he have formal training or did he just over the years had sort of figured out those things that you needed to do to, to get people hooked and to come in the door? Well, I would, you know, it's funny with him because he has a degree. And I say <laughs> that with quotations from Georgia state, which is totally a legit degree. Men <laughs> earned it. No question. But really, we know who did all the schoolwork, and it was my grandmother. So <laughs> I'm always reminded, and my, like I said, my grandfather is brilliant, and he's incredibly extroverted and loves people. He is one of the most well-connected people in Atlanta, um, especially for his era. And I, you know, I could go into a a ski shop or some sort of like local shop that's been around for a few years, and I'm like, oh yeah, my grandfather owns Knox. And this is Atlanta. Like this is several <laughs> several million people. Just a random store. Be like, oh yeah, you, you know, Bob Knox at Knox Jewelers and they would know him. So anyway, all that be said, he didn't have a, I, I mean, he did have a formal marketing training, but I think it was a lot of on the job observations mm -hmm. and he saw stuff that worked. Um, and I think the time that he spent working for other people before he started his own company really influenced the way that he ran his own company. Yeah, that's great. So you're now four years in with caffeine marketing, your baby, your passion. And I mean, tell us a little bit about, I mean, do you have a sort of a standard methodology or approach? Is there a way that you're sort of always coming in and helping clients or what does that look like for you? Yeah, there's two things that I think really help is how we uniquely help these companies. And one is that we start with strategy. So we don't offer like a card of services and that's totally fine if people do. Um, but for us, we know if we want to deliver on that brand promise of making marketing profitable, that's a little bit different for each company. So not every company needs to be running LinkedIn ads or Facebook ads or whatever. You know, they might actually need a lead generating PDF on their website that people download and then a seven part email series. So each one's a little bit different and it all the, I guess, depends on the business owner or the CMO or whoever that is and their goals and how much they want to grow their revenue. But we start with strategy, we design that first, and then ultimately they decide whether or not they want us to implement that, but we, you know, they could run with it free of charge, I guess, if they wanted to after that first call. And then the second part is that we use a seven part framework called Story Brand, created by this guy named Donald Miller in Tennessee. And it, what it does essentially is it uses these seven parts of story and helps make your marketing cut through the noise and make potential customers want to buy your product or service. So do you think that sort of in the, the era that we're in today, that same methodology works for small businesses? Because you think about like the coronavirus pandemic and how that yeah. is just really um, crippling a lot of small businesses. Do you think the same methodologies that worked three months ago are going to work in the future? So if we think of marketing in these, in these three buckets, um, this is an oversimplification. But it's, I, I like it. So you have brand awareness at the very top. You've got consideration in the middle and then conversion at the bottom. And conversion really is just a point at which you want somebody to do something. That could be applying for a job. That could be buying a product. That could be getting a quote. Any of that is the conversion thing that we're looking for. Sale, doesn't matter. Brand awareness at that point, people don't know who you are. So this is, this is just truth that's going to be true before and after this pandemic is that people are not going to buy your product or service unless they know who you are and what you offer and how you make their lives better. And then the second part is the consideration phase. And these people are aware of your product or service, but yet they're not, they're not ready to buy it. They've got hesitations, they've got objections, whichever, or they're not educated enough of the risk of risk of not buying your product and what their life is going to look like on the other side of buying your product. So there's a lot of stuff in that phase, but the nuts and bolts, I think probably will change a little bit. So you know, I think, you know, email is still always going to be a great method. Um, I, and I know it's not boring, but I think having a great website is going to be important. Um, I think maintaining a pretty decent social media presence is going to be important. But I think there might be unique opportunities in light of other people not doing certain things or emerging platforms. So just to name two that come to mind. One, TikTok might be a great platform to advertise on yeah. because there's a lot more people on TikTok right now than there was three or four months ago. And so that's an interesting idea to go, okay, how can we grow brand awareness? If you're a larger company, I think this really makes sense because you've now tapped out Facebook and Google. You've kind of maxed out those platforms for as much as you can get out of them. Now you're looking at additional platforms that you can increase your brand awareness on. TikTok might make a whole lot of sense. 
Now on the other side, there's a lot less people that are spending money on advertising. And so this is a really uncertain time and people, a lot of companies are going, you know what, we've, we're just trying to pay our employees. So we're going to cut an, our entire advertising budget, which is totally fine. And honestly, some stuff right now, you probably shouldn't be advertising just because it probably feels really tacky and insensitive. Well, but, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Um, but you look at the Facebook and Google marketplace and what you're doing in these advertising campaigns is you're bidding for attention. And if there's a lot less people bidding, it's going to be less expensive to show them ads. So there might be a unique opportunity there for companies that are still relevant right now during this time, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, part of your own, when I was looking at your, your website and sort of getting to know you before this conversation, I could, I could see in your story that, you know, for yourself, um, a pretty powerful theme is overcoming adversity. And so I have to imagine that as you're working with leaders, especially small leaders who are maybe, um, struggling to get their company up and moving the way that they know it could, um, that that is still a theme in the work that you're doing today. Would that be a, a true statement? Do you, do you feel that in the work you're doing? Yeah. I mean, I feel like we're all trying to find something more than just the actual nuts and bolts of the work that we're doing. And so for me, that's honestly why we try to stick with these small companies is because mm -hmm. I connect to them personally. Like I can look the owner in the eye and I feel like it's not a, Hey, let me just take your money. I'm going shoulder to shoulder with these people. And even if it's a smaller company that I'm talking like the CMO, often the CMO is the, you know, he's the marketing guy and the sales guy, yeah. but he's responsible for both and he can't make it all happen. So one guy, you know, I'm texting back and forth and you know, I just, I care about these people and I'm empathetic to the position they are in their life, both as a business owner and as an executive who's trying to, um, you know, do their job well or provide for their family. I've, Heck, I've been the son of entrepreneurs and business leaders who have done that. So I'm very empathetic to that for sure. Yeah, great. So I want to switch gears a little bit because definitely the folks that are listening to us chat um, today are going to be, you know, HR leaders and TA leaders and sales and marketing can sometimes feel like this outside space from them, but really it is it is definitely a piece of what we do as recruiters and really just as an employers and trying to, um, you know, market to the potential employee uh, versus the consumer in the work that you're doing. Are you working right now at all? Or have you in the past that, that, that sales and marketing work you're doing with companies starts to bleed over into that sort of employer marketing and recruitment marketing branding space? Yes. Especially in this, you know, that framework that I was telling you a little bit earlier about the story mm -hmm. brand framework that works especially well as far as branding your company for a potential employees to apply for. And what I mean by that is the premise of the seven part framework is to not play the hero of the story in your marketing, but instead play the guide. And I feel like that's really important. If you're a, an employer who's looking to hire great people, great people are not looking for another hero out there. They're looking for someone else to help them win the day. And they're looking to be a part of a bigger story. So if you can tell a story with your company, and not just talk about your history, how, you know, blah, 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 when you were started. People don't care about that. <laughs> what they want to do is they want to be caught up into something that's bigger than themselves. They want to play a role in a story that matters. And so if you can introduce them into that story in your marketing, I think you're going to be way better off. And, uh, you know, part of that is helping them win the day. And so if you look at your career page or your jobs page on your website, I think that thing should be what we would call story branded. And by that, you know, you should have the potential employee as the hero of that story and you should let them know what are they going to win? What's like, what's, what's in it for them to work at your company? And also what's at risk if they don't work at your company and how are you uniquely positioned to help them as an employer? So I think those are all things that we kind of subconsciously think about, like, you know, benefits or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, work-life balance, all that jazz, but we have to take it as the point that, Hey, we are the guides as the employer and we're not the hero of the story. I think that's a really um, great way to put it. Um, in that, that sort of perspective of the hero versus the guide, because you're right as we're um, 
as they're coming to our career site, but even for us as recruiters, as practitioners, once we're engaging in that relationship with a candidate, we're still acting in that, that space as a guide and, and helping them continue to, in a, a little bit more concrete way, start to feel what it would be like to be a part of that, that organization. And so I think that's just a really interesting way to, to frame that. Um, and I think it makes it really, um, easily digestible for anybody to understand like how, how to apply it, like why it makes sense. Cause I think sometimes we can, um, you know, our plans or our discussions can get pretty lofty and, and big sounding. Um, and that really sort of grounds it, I think. So it's a really interesting approach. I love it. Um, you know, with, for recruiters, we are a little bit sales and marketing. Um, uh, I, I laugh when I say that because I, I personally, as a recruiter, I hate to ever be considered sales and marketing because I, it somehow sales has this connotation of less humanistic, but I think the type of sales and marketing you're talking about, it sort of puts that on its head a little bit from that traditional stigma of it being a less sort of human approach and being that much more about the person you're interacting with and really seeing the consumer as a, a person there versus just like a, a hard sell, which I mean, it's fantastic. Um, but as a recruiter, if I need to, you know, reach out and, and sort of have that elevator pitch ready or whatnot, you know, are there sort of, I mean, do you have favorite tips and tricks? Can you, can you pull the curtain back and tell us anything about what are the, like some of those key components that you just need to always have at the ready if you want to be sort of a walking sales and marketing person? <laughs> totally. And I feel like, you know, as you, I was thinking it earlier, but I feel like recruiters for sure you know, there's a huge sales element to it and a huge marketing element to it. And I think those two are, you can divide them if you want, but you can also think of them as the same. You can't sell to somebody if they don't know who you are. Right. And if they're considering working with you, that's a part in the sales process anyway. So if we take that, extrapolate it out and we think of you, that's a part in the sales process anyway. So if we take that, extrapolate it out and we think, okay, what is marketing? Marketing is trying to get people to take some sort of action. And that action in this case is for them to actually, you know, potentially apply and work for this company. And that's a sales process in itself. If you want to attract really great talent. So if we take that approach of being the guide, and if we really believe in our product and service, I think that we can come in with this approach that we care about the individual and genuinely do because we ultimately want them to win the day. Mm -hmm. So if we can take that approach and we can come in with, do it with empathy, I don't think that we have to feel sleazy or like that greasy guy who sells, you know, used cars or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because we're going to care about the consumer or in this case, the potential employee. So I, I think it is, it's very much sales and marketing. Um, I think it all comes down to your approach. I, t I heard Tony Robbins speak about it one time and he was saying, or it was, you're there to help these people. And if you can take that approach, I think there's less pressure in it because when I, when I'm overcoming objections in a sales process with somebody, I'm not coming into it thinking, gosh, if they don't sign up for this thing, then I'm going to lose money or my company's not going to make enough money. I'm coming into it going, I know I can help them. I know I like, here's exactly how I'm going to help them win the day and grow their company and help them be a successful business owner, an entrepreneur or a CMO or whatever. I know exactly how I'm going to do that for them. And I believe in my product and it's actually going to help. What my job is now is to help them make that risky step of working with us because when they're, letting go of time and resources in that scenario that they're putting them at risk. And when somebody signs up to work for someplace else, there's an opportunity cost, or maybe there's a better job somewhere else. So if we can see ourselves as guides to help them overcome those barriers, I think we're better off. But as far as messaging and elevator pitches, my favorite, it's a, we call it a one liner. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, this is a story brand reference, but it's a prop a product and a resolution. And what I mean by that, is you introduce a problem and this could be, I'm going to totally make this up on the spot. So bear with, you know, <laughs> <laughs> forgive me here, but um, most companies only care about the bottom line, but here at caffeine marketing, we care about small business owners and entrepreneurs who are trying to put food on the table and be successful and, you know, and fulfill their dreams. That's why, you know, you can be a part of something bigger and make a difference here at caffeine marketing problem, product resolution. The problem is that most companies do this. And again, I, don't, I wouldn't, you know, make other companies the villain. So I, that one's kind of iffy. But <laughs> the the second part is the product of, hey, working for caffeine, this is what you're going to do. And then lastly, the resolution is making that difference. Because let's say that we think that that's the thing that they want, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's great. That's really helpful. Um, how does, how, tell us a little bit about recruiting at Caffeine Marketing. I mean, how big is your 
company? Do you do a lot of recruiting yourself and marketing? I mean, how big is your company? Do you do a lot of recruiting yourself? And what is that like? Yeah. So um, I had a friend of mine, and this is, we're going to get into the nuts and details of how my, my company is structured, which is totally fine with me because I, I designed it this way with the um, you know, client in mind. So we have, I'm the only full-time employee, but I've got a team of 10 people that are all contractors that I, you know, I have, they're the best Squarespace person, they're the best Shopify person, um, advertising, wireframe, copywriting, all of that. And I've been able to bring in all these different experts. Um, and for a while we went the route of like hiring W2 employees, which is a completely valid route. But a friend of mine was, I don't know. I felt like he was better serving people with this model. And so I decided to adopt this model as well. It's, it's so, a similar model to what proactive talent actually had when we first started. What we, we called ourselves a tribe of freelancers. So totally yeah, get the model. <laughs> totally. And all these people, they, you know, they have to deliver an amazing product. Um, and they also, all that being said, I think it was, this works out better. So as I look at this, for me, I, if I'm, let's say I'm going to try to find an additional Squarespace person because because we're just doing so many Squarespace sites, I've kind of tapped out that person at this point. I'm now trying to find, you know, I can, I can go do a Google search for all these contractors, but I can also run ads because there's people that are probably familiar with Caffeine that follow Caffeine on social media or whatever, or can our website, and they have web design experience. And now I can actually show retargeting ads to them on Facebook or Google or YouTube or whatever. And they're already interested in Caffeine. And now I'm retargeting them with ads and I know that they have a specialty in web design. So those are like super hot leads, we would call them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, one example of how we would do recruiting in that case. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly, um, you're, you're applying your, your own approach to what, how you would help others do sales and marketing to the consumer space, but you're applying it to your recruiting process and it, and it, yep. it works. Um, that's awesome. So I think I, um, so I think I, forgive me if I get the name wrong, but don't you have something also called caffeine labs? And is that, is that, <laughs> What is that exactly? I haven't, haven't heard you mention it quite yet, but I'm curious. Yeah, I've got a lot um, of fun projects going on right now. <laughs> so I've got Caffeine Labs, which is a blast, um, but it basically outlines the exact framework that I've used to grow my company's revenue, like bottom line revenue. I've doubled it every year for the last three years. And so I lay out that framework of how to hyper optimize your business, yourself, and your leadership. And so that's a course basically breaking down all of that into Lego blocks. And it's just like mm -hmm. assembling all of that to scale and grow your company like like I have. So um, that's one, that's Caffeine Labs, that's that online course. Um, and that one's specifically called Business Mastery within Caffeine Labs. It's like the education arm of our company. But the other fun thing I'm a part of is this investment group where we basically partner alongside existing business owners and entrepreneurs who are stuck in their business or have plateaued their revenue. Say they're stuck at like you know, 500,000 or a million or whatever, and they can't seem to scale and grow their company or they're just tired and worn out and they've just taken and it's just take, taking a toll on them, uh, but they want to reap the rewards of their, their hard work in their business. So we'll come alongside them, help them scale and grow their company um, as a partner. And sometimes we'll turn around and sell that company. So that's also super, super fun. Yeah. When you're working with companies, either through the investment group or caffeine labs or, or through caffeine marketing, any of your customers, are you seeing sort of the same kinds of challenges and barriers? Like you mentioned there, maybe they're just tired of it, or maybe they're, they're getting stuck at this plateau. Are they running into the same bumps along the way? Are you seeing the same sort of patterns across those companies? Yeah. And I'll, uh, there's, there's one very tactical and there's one thing that I'm going to go on a risk and say, like, this is a mindset that I see a lot. Um, the tactical one in the marketing, here's the two mistakes that they make. They make themselves the hero of their own marketing. That's a pr very easy thing to fix is using the story run process to flip that script and make themselves the guide. And then the other one is they don't measure they don't measure anything. And so you cannot improve anything that you don't measure. You can't manage something you don't measure. So you have to measure your conversions. You have to measure your cost per acquisition. You have to measure how much it costs to acquire a new customer. What's your average order value? What's the lifetime value of your customer? And when I start saying this to business owners in our intro call, they look at me sometimes like I'm speaking a foreign language. And honestly, if they don't know that and they don't know their margin and their products and services, you cannot scale because you don't know how much that you can spend on ads. And so you might spend 10 grand in ads in a week and you might go, Oh my gosh, that's so much money. But in reality, you're making 10 X that. And so it, if you don't measure those things, you cannot, you cannot scale and grow. Now, the other thing, and I'm, I'm sorry to all the real estate agents and lawyers out there. Cause I'm just gonna, <laughs> this is gonna like offend somebody, 
but I tell my wife we like go on walks together like every every day now, uh, which is so so weird thing where you know it's not only these two types of people, but it's like lawyers and real estate agents sometimes have this weird scarcity thing, and a lot of other small business owners do as well. But it's like they're scared to invest in something, even if it's got a proven track record of working, or they're afraid to trust people. Mm-hmm. And it's like this weird scarcity mindset that I can't quite put the right word on, but that is the thing that sabotages their company. And a lot of these business owners that we'll work with in partnerships, we're essentially having, you know, they are the bottleneck. And so when we, you know, they start to step aside, we create systems and processes that run in their place. And then ultimately the business can scale from there because it's not wholly dependent on them. And so if, if everything has to come through the owner, I, it, you cannot scale that because at some point that owner has a finite, you know, mental bandwidth as well as time. And you're not going to be able to, you know, reach, you know, s- seven figures or whatever the number is, whatever the number is. I can't imagine those are easy conversations to have, to tell the, the owner, we're going to need you to, <laughs> we're going to need you to stop now. <laughs> yeah. I, um, well, thankfully, you know, I, it, I, I don't know what the right word is for this, but I'm maybe not the contrarian in our partnership group, but I try to not be in these in negotiation calls. Um, I try to be only in our partnership calls. And the reason is, is because I'm not romantically connected to the business or the business owner. Mm-hmm. So for example, we had a call on Thursday. Um, one guy's like feeling really pumped up about this potential, like potential partnership. And I'm like, Hey, honestly, I don't, the numbers don't seem to work out for us right there. Like, I just don't see that, but he is emotionally connected to that person because he spent so much time with him. He really likes him. Um, so it's helpful to not be in that room and scenario. And so in that most of the time, I don't have to have the conversation. I just tell my partners who already have the relationship with these guys. I'm like, Hey man, this is kind of, this is what's happening here. Uh, but there's times I will have, I'm like, Hey man, this is kind of, this is what's happening here. Uh, but there's times I will have to say stuff like that. But the one time, that I said something like that was to a lawyer. Um, this is, this is, I was, I knew that he was not gonna, wait, he said something like he was spending $200 on paper at like uh, postcard ads or something like that. And I knew <laughs> in that moment, I was like, this is not gonna work out. And I was not trying to be ugly to the guy, but I was like, hey, immediately that, in that moment, my mindset, like my mindset switched. I thought I have to help this guy and I'm gonna tell him some really hard truth and I'll let him decide whether or not he's actually gonna listen to this. And I, I don't even remember his name, um, but I'm talking to him on the phone. I said, hey, you're not going to want to hear this. You're gonna, not going to want to listen to me. You're going to dismiss what I'm going to say. Um, and honestly, I just, I'm only saying this right now because I think this will be helpful for you. I don't, I'm not going to benefit anything from this. You're probably going to not like me and hang up, the, you know, we're in this conversation. <laughs> but I was like, you are throwing stuff on the wall and you have no throwing stuff on the wall and you have no rhyme or reason. And you're just, you know, you're being cheap. You are just throwing stuff. And I just probably felt like accusations to him, but I felt bad for him because he would be really cheap in one regard and then spend a ton of money in another regard and then not measure any of the conversions. Um, yeah. I mean, it's another guy that reminds me of this is I'm, so, I'm kind of going on another story rant. Here. I'll, I'll just say this last one, but this guy, uh, we had worked with him for, almost a year. Um, great guy. And so we were coming to the end, you know, end of our terms or whatever. And they had hired somebody in house, which is great. You know, we'd help them grow. They could hire in house. Totally understand. That's the first thing they want to do. No worries. And so he's like, Evan, what do you think we should do next? I'm like, well, you know, you've got a couple million dollar business here. Um, half of your revenue comes on from your e-commerce site. I think it would probably be very advantageous for you to get a really a, a lot better site. So completely redesign the thing, optimize it for conversions because right now you're crushing whatever on it. So I think you should spend 20 grand or so on a new website and make sure that thing is killer. Um, you're going to increase conversions, all the jazz. And he was, he about passed out. This is a Harvard grad. And he was like, Oh my gosh, I could never spend that much money on a website. That's just so expensive. I'm thinking you're insane because if you just increase your conversions by 15, 20%, you're going to pay for that 10 times over. So that's another one of those scarcity things. If that helps bring a um, visual to it, I guess. Yeah. So what about on the flip side? Are there sort of leadership traits or qualities you see that are sort of signifiers of like really going to be the successful cases and the, you know, the people that are really going to be able to take it next level? Yes. Um, 
and I'm, I'm not perfect at all these. Um, that let me just disclaimer that, but <laughs> grit. <laughs> so I'm not saying this is like, Oh yeah, he's great or whatever, but grit and hard work. I'm going to classify that as one. I think that's a pre-qualifier for being a successful business leader. Um, at, at any level. I think that you have to have that. If you're lazy, it's going to be a really hard time growing a company because you don't want to take shortcuts and all that jazz. So there's that one. The other one is self-awareness. Um, this one is really hard to essentially manage or even understand about yourself. Um, I'm sure that whatever I think I have as far as self-awareness, I'm off on because we're just so close to our own selves. It's hard to look ourselves in the mirror and have an accurate picture of ourselves. And I say that one time because I just there was a woman who was talking to me about self-awareness in that moment. I was like, you're like the least self-aware person I know, but it was just so <laughs> funny. Um, and I'm, that's probably what somebody's thinking about me and that's totally fine. <laughs> and that's okay. I bring it on. You know, I already, I already know that. So, uh, you grit and hard work, self-awareness. And then lastly, I think the biggest key to leadership is empathy. And that sounds so fluffy, um, as a, quote Enneagram eight, if you're familiar with that personality test, uh, I'm very cut, you know, cut straight to the point, but I, and empathy is not always my strong point, but I do think that that is probably the thing that is the biggest key to being successful in leadership, because if you can be empathetic to the people that you lead and not just, Hey, did I hurt their feelings or whatever, but imagine what they're thinking and feeling. And so if I'm going to bring a contractor, I'm going to say, Hey, we're going to have a team lunch as a team. Uh, these people are contractors. And they're, one of them is hourly. And so I bet that person right there is wondering, hey, am I going to get paid for going to lunch with these people or do I have to do this on my own time? And so instead of just letting her try to figure that out or guess, I'm like, hey, by the way, this is all going to be paid. So just come on with it. And so I think it's small stuff like that. If you can just be empathetic to the people that you're leading, I think you're going to be way better off as a leader and they're going to ultimately trust you. And I had another time where, again, they're not on my W-2 or whatever payroll but they're on my team and I treat them like they are on my team. And then one time a client was just being crazy ugly. They had to hire somebody else and um, brought somebody else who's like our contact and they were just really mean and hurtful and it very, was very inappropriate. And so that person came to me and they were obviously very hurt about that. And I didn't go and read the client out, but I just went over to the client's you know, office and we just talked it through. And I was like, Hey, honestly, this is not going to work. And I, could I have continued to keep the money? Sure. Could totally have just continued that relationship quote relationship. But that's not what I needed to do for my team. I had to be empathetic that my team had just been really mistreated. And I did not see that that was going to change anytime soon. So I decided, hey, it's just not worth it. Even though I had little to no interaction with these people. So, so I would think, I, like I hear you telling this story and in my head, I think something I would add to that leadership list is the willingness to make hard decisions, even if it's potentially going to affect that, that bottom line negatively for the short term, just sort of mm -hmm. knowing like, it's better for the big term, big, big picture. Yeah. At the end of the day, I think this is what I try to keep in my mind is really what matters a hundred years from now. And for me, that's going to be about legacy and my, my faith and how I treat people. So if I could just keep that in mind, some couple thousand dollars here and there really is not a big deal because yeah. people are the things that matter a hundred years from now. Yeah. So as we're wrapping up, if there's one thing you want to make sure those, you know, our, our HR and TA and just leaders in general or that are listening to us are take away from this conversation or take away from Evan Knox, what would that be? Well, you kind of mentioned it at some point um, earlier on, but I feel like we're all victim or I guess we're all susceptible to a victim mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like if we can have an internal locus of control, because right now there's a lot of chaotic stuff going on in our economy. Um, and I'm sure that I've heard both sides from the hiring, you know, hiring point of view. There's a ton of people who are losing their jobs there, but there's also crazy demand on the other side. And so that's got to feel really chaotic. So I would just encourage you as much as you can try not to have a victim mindset. Anytime that you're complaining about something, that's often a good indicator that, you know, you're feeling a victim to somebody else. And that is what we would call an external locus of control. You're basically handing over control of your life to somebody else with some, some circumstance or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you can have an internal locus of control, I feel like your peace of mind and your quality of life is going to be way better. And you're going to be able to be a better leader because you're not victim to what other people say, think, or do, you know, whether it be our economy or our president or whatever, you know, it's like control you and leave the less, the rest up to the, to God or the universe. So we have Evan Knox, not only sales and marketing guru, but also therapist. <laughs> <laughs>
I love it. No, that's great. I think that's really important mindset for us to have, right? Or sort of frame of mind to have as we're in this really interesting time. And I don't mean interesting in a positive way, just interesting Mm -hmm. in an interesting way. Um, Sort of time in life where everything we were doing three months ago, maybe it will work. Um, but we have to pause and reflect and, and really understand it. Um, and I think in doing that, it's important to make sure that our evaluation doesn't immediately go outward and, and, you know, allow us to just sit and point the finger. Um, so I think that's, I think that's really important. Um, if folks want to get in touch with you, if they'd like to chat with you more and, and learn more about caffeine marketing, uh, how's, how, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, the easiest way is going to be going to caffeine.marketing. There's no .com, it's just caffeine.marketing or evanknox.com, either one of those. And I've also got a free guide on how to build a winning sales funnel for anybody who's in that sales and marketing space, whether it be recruiting or a business leader. And it's literally kind of the Lego blocks of how to build a sales funnel and it's completely free. So you can just grab that on my website. Awesome, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Evan. It's been great chatting with you today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Courtney. So Evan Knox, another goodie to add to our uh, archive there. Yeah. Uh, I like uh, I like some of the things, well, I like some of that. Thinking, is there anything I didn't like what he said? Uh, <laughs> there, I like what he said about people don't care about a company's history. They want a compelling story. I thought that made a lot of sense when he said that. Yeah. I mean, I, I get what he's saying, although I... I don't know. I think sometimes people do care a little bit about, about the backstory there. There's some additional context around what they're doing. But I think what the point he was making is still valid is that it's how you tell that story. It's how you create the narrative around what that is versus just sort of a, you've been around forever. So you automatically get, you know, credit with folks just for being there for a long time. Yeah. And the whole brutally being brutally honest with potential customers. I can see that working well, and I can see that maybe not working well. (laughs) Sometimes you have to be a politician, right? Yeah. But I will say for someone in the consulting space in particular, if you have the, um, the ability or the privilege of being in a space where you get to maybe pick and choose the types of people that you're working with, it may help quickly weed out those that you're going to be really, really successful with because they are open to that kind of brutal honesty versus somebody who may not be responsive to it you know, it's probably better you figure that out on the front end of the relationship than after investing a lot of time and headbutting. So true. So true. Got a question for the listeners. Hey, listeners, how many of you out there who are entrepreneurs know how to hustle and pivot when necessary, which is something else that have been talked about? Um, he mentioned also about how entrepreneurs fight off, need to fight off a victim uh, mindset. Is that something that you struggle with, uh, dear listener? If so, please drop us a comment. We would love to hear from you. You can reach us at tribepod at proactivetalent.com. That's T-R-I-B-E-P-O-D at proactivetalent.com. We would so love to hear from you. Thanks. It's been a good one. <laughs>